What's going on, family? This is Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. I want to take a look at a fight that took place July 17th, 1935, and November 29th, 1935. Between a great African-American light heavyweight champion, who would become champion on October 31st, 1935, when he defeated Bob Olin in St. Louis, Missouri Arena. John Henry Lewis was an outstanding fighter. He would face Maxi Rosenblum, phenomenal light heavyweight champion, Jewish American. They called him Splashy Maxi. A reporter gave him that name when he noticed that Maxi Rosenblum would swing with an open glove and slap his opponents. And this would be the reason for 19 KOs out of 274 total bouts, 207 wins, 39 losses with 26 draws. Now, there are fight records that state that Maxi Rosenblum would have over 300 fights, 282 fights. But for the sake of this conversation, we're going to stick with 274 total bouts. Now, Maxi Rosenblum would stand 5 foot 10 and a half inches and have a 72 and a half inch reach. He be entered into the Ring Boxing Hall of Fame in 1972 and an International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in 1984. He become an actor a business owner, a club owner, a comedian club owner when he retired from boxing. One of the movies he'd be involved in would be Requiem for a Heavyweight with Jack Palance. Maxie Rosenblum was an outstanding fighter. And he would take on fights with fighters such as John Henry Lewis fought him in three separate occasions. We're going to get into that fight. But at that time, John Henry Lewis had a fighting career record of 48, 4, and 4. And then again in 49, 6, and 4. He would face Al Gaynor, outstanding African-American fighter. Deacon Leo Kelly fought him twice. Another black fighter. Bob Olin. He would lose his championship belt to Bob Olin. He would face Lee Ramage four separate occasions. Now, Lee Ramage would be the fighter that would let everybody know that Joe Lewis was the truth. You see, Joe Lewis would knock Lee Ramage out in, with a three-inch punch. Now, that's hard to do because it takes away your momentum and the torque of your punches. You have to be able to punch in order to pull that punch off. And that's how great of a puncher Joe Lewis was. Maxie Rosenblum would also face Harry Greb. And at that time, Harry Greb would have a fighting career record of 244, 15, and 18. He would lose to Harry Greb. But most opponents did. I have Harry Greb ranked number two of my all-time great fighters. Harry Greb would take on Gene Tunney five separate occasions. He would win one and lose four. There would be three fights in that fight series with Tom. Gene Tunney. That would be very suspicious to most observers at that time. But the fact of the matter is, Harry Greb would at least win one of those five fights. Maxi Rosenblum would face Jimmy Slattery. At that time, Jimmy Slattery would have a fighting career record of 137-0. He would face Allentown Joe Gans. 66-18 and 15 would be the record of Allentown Joe Gans. He would face Dave Shade two separate times. 97, 16, and 52. 97, 17, and 52 would be the career record of Dave Shade. At the time, he would face Maxie Rosenblum. Jamaica Kid. Johnny Wilson. Johnny Wilson had a career fighting record of 61, 27, and 8. Now, Johnny Wilson would lose his middleweight championship strap in 1923 to Harry Greb. Harry Greb would eventually lose his title to the great Tiger Flowers in 1926. And then he would lose again in a rematch. Johnny Wilson would pick up that championship strap in 1920. He would face Mickey Walker. Walker had a career record of 123, 20, and 5 at that time. Mickey, Mickey Walker would win a, a welterweight championship strap from Jack Britton. He would lose it to Pete Latcho, but then he would pick it back up from Pete Latcho, and he would win the middleweight championship strap from Tiger Flowers. Rosenblum would face Tiger Flowers three separate occasions. 
Flowers would have a fighting career record of 118, 14, and 5. He would face Larry One Punch Johnson. Phil Kaplan, another champion, 55, 13, and 5, faced him two separate occasions. Ace Hutkins, the Nebraska Wildcat, 65, 16, and 13, would be his record. At the time, he would face Maxie Rosenblum. Young Stribbling, unfortunately, motorcycle accident. But he would have a fighting career record of 154, 9, and 16. Jimmy Braddock, who would become heavyweight champion in the world when he would defeat Max Bear, and he would become the Cinderella Man, and he would lose his championship strap in 1937 to the Brown Bomber Joe Lewis with an eight-round knockout. But he would have a fighting career record of 36, 7, and 6, and he would face Maxie Rosenblum two separate occasions. Leo Lomsky, another fantastic fighter, fought him three separate occasions. But the fight, first fight, they would have a fighting record 46, 5, and 1. Would Leo Lomsky's correct be? Jack Malone would be the first fighter that Mickey Walker would face as he moved up to the middleweight division. And Walker would come up short. Jack Malone was an outstanding fighter. He had a fighting career record of 83, 21, and 5. Pete Lacho, 83, 21, and 5. He fought Pete Lacho two separate occasions. Charlie Ballinger, who would wind up becoming the light heavyweight champion of Canada. Fighting career record of 39-11-5 for them two separate occasions. Jack McVeigh, an outstanding colored middleweight champion from Harlem. He would have a fighting career record of 62-13-5 and 72-21-5. And and that would be his fighting career record at the time he would face Maxie Rosenblum. Now, Jack McVeigh would eventually lose his colored middleweight championship strap to Harry Smith, who I have ranked number four as the greatest middleweight champion of all times. Although he had the colored middleweight championship strap, but he was an outstanding knockout machine. He would have a record of 55. One loss with 54 knockouts at the time of his career would end. I'm speaking of Harry Smith. Cuban Bobby Brown. Fighting record of 35-5-2 and two, for them two separate occasions. Cuban Bobby Brown was from Philadelphia. He would face Ted Kid Lewis, who would have a 25 fight series with Jack Britton. And he had a fighting career record coming in at 234-44-23. He would face Al Gaynor, 32-10-4. Now John Henry Lewis was born May 1914, Los Angeles, California. He died April 18, 1974. He was 59 years of age at the time of his death. Phoenix, Arizona, and then California. He stood 5 foot 11 inches and had a 75 and a half inch reach. He became light heavyweight champion October 31st, 1935, when he would defeat Bob Olin. He had a fighting career record of 116, 100 wins, 56 knockouts, 11 losses. He'd be stopped one time. And that would be the Brown Bomber, Joe Lewis. He would have five draws. Now what's amazing about John Henry Lewis, my understanding is that rapper LL Cool J, adopted mother, oldest brother, would be John Henry Lewis. You see, L.O. Cool J had a grandmother who he stayed with on Farmers Boulevard in Queens. Well, his grandmother adopted a young girl. And that would be L.O. Cool J's biological mother. But his biological mother was adopted. And John Henry Lewis would be her uncle. And what's amazing about that was that John Henry Lewis would be the great nephew of Tom Molyneux. Tom Molyneux was an outstanding heavyweight. And he would eventually face Tom Cribb in England. But he was a slave that would get his freedom rights. He would actually fight his way to freedom. 
he would go to Harlem, take on all comers. And when he couldn't get enough action in Harlem, he would find out about an amazing English heavyweight champion, quote unquote. And he had to challenge him, so he would take a steamboat that took a few weeks to get to England. And he would search all the bars until a former welterweight champion, well, not so much champion, but fighter, I would say, Bill Richmond, would discover Tom Molyneux. And Bill Richmond lost to Tom Cribb, and he won a redemption. And he felt he could make a lot of money with Tom Molyneux. And Tom Malu wanted nothing more than to get in the ring with Tom Cribb. So they made that happen. In the 33rd round of a 39-round fight, Tom Malu would knock out Tom Cribb. And there in England, there's no way they're going to allow that to happen. So the corner man would jump in. And someone cracked Tom Marlon who over the head with a small steel pipe. But this would get enough time for Tom Cribb to recover. And when he got himself together, the referee and the officials would check the hands of Tom Marlon because it was he was accused of having a handful of metal pellets in his hands. And they looked all over the ring and, and tried to find evidence of metal, uh, metal pellets and they couldn't find it. And they would ask Tom Cribb, are you okay? And he recovered. And they would continue to fight. And at this time, Tom Molyneux had hurt his hand. Because of the mayhem that happened when they were interfering with that fight. And eventually Tom Cribb would defeat Tom Molyneux. And it would be a rematch. But there would be no way that Tom Molyneux would go to England and defeat Tom Cribb. That wasn't going to happen. But that's an interesting story. And L.O. Cool J's aunt, Joan, was part of the Black Panther movement. She used to give out food and clothing. So John Henry Lewis was an interesting individual. He would face Jimmy Braddock. Jim Braddock had a fighting record at that time of 42, 18, and 7. Faced him two separate occasions. Bobby Brown. Cuba's Bobby Brown. He was from Philadelphia. Izzy Singer. Fighting record of 15, 8, and 6. Bob Olin. He would face John Henry Lewis October 31st, 1935. And at that time, he had a fighting career record of 48, 15, and 4. And he would fight in St. Louis, Missouri Arena. And John Henry Lewis would become... The first black light heavyweight champion. Phenomenal. He would face L. A. Feldman, 28-4-2. Now, which is interesting, in 1938, John Henry Lewis was the light heavyweight champion. Joe Lewis became heavyweight champion in 1937. So he was the heavyweight champion in 38. Henry Armstrong was a featherweight champion, 1937, when he would take the title away from Petey Simone. And in 1938, he would win the welterweight from Barney Ross and the lightweight from Lou Ambers. So in 1938, a black fighter would have the featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight championship strap. And in 1940, you would have Georgie Pace. Unbelievable. Great year, 1938. Now, John Henry Lewis would eventually have his license revoked. No fault of his own. But he couldn't pass an eye examination. And a fight doctor would make a recommendation to the State Athletic Commission to remove John Henry Lewis's license because of failed vision. And because Joe, uh, John Henry Lewis needed the money, he would speak to a good friend of his, Joe Lewis, and say, I need to fight Joe. I need the money. And Joe Lewis didn't want to fight him. He would rather give him the money. But of course, 
the handlers of Joe Lewis and Mike Jacobs, they want a back end of the money. They want it promotional rights. So that's the only way to pull that fight off. And Joe Lewis said, look, I don't want to have to do this. We're friends. John Henry Lewis said, look, after this, I can't fight anymore. So Joe Lewis went in the ring and knocked him out in one round. And when he went back to the dressing room, John Henry Lewis walked over to Joe Lewis's dressing room and thanked him. And Joe Lewis told him, don't come back again. John Henry Lewis was 24 years old. He was 5 foot 11, 75 and a half inch reach. Fighting record of 110, 5, and 56 knockouts. Joe Lewis was also 24. He was six and a half feet, 76 inches in reach. 30 and 1. Arthur Donovan was the referee. Short night work. But I just wanted to go through the career records of these two men. Now, the fight with Maxi Rosenblum and John Henry Lewis. Fight took place November 16th, 1932. And Maxi Rosenblum had a fighting career record of 146, 28, and 16. Their second fight, July 10th, 1933. Rosenblum had a fighting career record of 164, 29, and 17. In their third fight, July 3rd, 1933. July 31st, 1933, 164, 30, and 18. And I got to tell you, that was some fight. All three fights were classics. John Henry Lewis could fight. Maxie Rosenblum could fight. He just couldn't punch, but he was a very good boxer. He moved from side to side, and he knew how to keep the jab out. And that's what extended the rounds of both fights. Both fighters were phenomenal fighters. And I just have to tell you, you're looking at two dynamite fighters here, John Henry Lewis to your right and Maxie Rosenblum to your left. Now, Bob Olin became a fighter when the stock market would crash. And that's what he did. He was a broker before he became boxer. But there was no other work out there, so he turned professional. And he was pretty successful as a fighter. Maxie Rosenblum, as I stated, he became a club owner. He was an actor. And he played in the role of Reckman to a heavyweight. And that's a very good movie. You need to check that movie out. But thanks for hanging in there with me. This is Scrapple Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fistic of Series, stating all great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. I just wanted to go through these two fighters' career because I believe these are two dynamite light heavyweight champions. Salute to my subscribers. Salute to John Henry Lewis and Maxie Rosenblum for their outstanding contributions to the game. Salute. I just want to add a footnote that Maxie Rosenblum, how phenomenal he was. He fought Mickey Walker, November 3rd, 1933, in Madison Square Garden. And what's amazing is Mickey Walker weighed 173 and a half pounds. And Maxie Rosenblum also weighed 173 and a half pounds. Remember, Mickey Walker was a welterweight and middleweight. Then he became a light heavyweight. He also challenged Jack Sharkey and wanted to become a 12-round draw. And then he would face Max Schmeling and he would be stopped with Max Schmeling. But with Jack Sharkey, that fight would go the distance and two weeks later, Jack Sharkey would become heavyweight champion of the world. Phenomenal. So this Mickey Walker and Maxie Rosenblum fight was a 15-round affair and with the distance, it was a unanimous decision in favor of Maxie Rosenblum. Referee was Eddie Forbes and he scored it 9-4-2 to Walker. 
Max Rose and Boomer also faced Jane Buttock. What's interesting about that fight? November 10th, 1931. Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was at the auditorium. And Rosenblum weighed 180 pounds. And Braddock weighed 178 pounds. But Maxi Rosenblum and James Braddock would not get paid. Referee George Barton. The fight was stopped in the second of 10 rounds. St. Paul, Minnesota State Athletic Commission would withhold the purse. $219,000. And what's amazing, that purse would be held. $350 of that would be distributed, distributed between the two fighters for training and traveling expenses only. $1,491 Minneapolis and St. Paul, Rosenblum would originally would earn and receive $1,195 uh, $1, and Braddock would receive $996. Fascinating. Maxi Rosenblum and Bob Olin, November 16, 1934. Rosenblum weighed 173 and a half and Olin weighed 172. And Olin would eventually take this title away from Rosenblum. The referee was Arthur Donovan. The judge was Harold Barnes. Chalky Lynch. And the decision would go to Rosenblum. Maxi Rosenblum versus Tiger Jack Fox. September 6, 1935. 182 pounds would be uh, Maxi Rosenblum's weight, and 182 pounds would be Tiger Jack Fox's weight. Ten round of fair distance would go to Maxi Rosenblum. September 6, 1935. So that's just a footnote. I wanted to slide in this video. So thanks for hanging in there with me. Once again, Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fistico Series. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Salute.